Welcome to everybody. We'll, as usual, start by thinking about those who have helped us along our way and to pay our respects to those that have come before. First and foremost, we, we think about and we send our love to our dear Gurudev, Sadhu Maharaj. We think about and send our love and prayers to the memory of our Param Gurudev, Gurudev's Gurudev, Radha Govind Das Babaji Maharaj. And we think about Prabhupada, Bhaktivanta Prabhupada Maharaj, who gave us this translation and this, this commentary that's been so important for us and for Gurudev as well. We can think about and remember and pay our respects to the Goswamis who first formulated the message brought to us by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. First and mostly Rupa Goswami and Raghunatha Das Goswami. Rupa, who was the philosopher of the Goswamis and, and set out the principles in writing of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching, and Raghunatha Das Goswami, who so very, very passionately lived it out, and giving us many writings, and the one that we, we have so much pleasure in reading over and over again is Velapa Kusmanjali. We can also name Prabodhananda Sarasati, the, the author of the prayer Aradharasa Sudhaniti. And then we remember the commentator of both of these beautiful prayers, Anantadas Babaji Maharaj. And not last, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself and Radha Mohan who inspire us in what we're trying to do here today. And we give our respects to the Acharyas, those wise men and women who have come before and are still with us and helping us to find our path together with our Gurudev. And finally, the Vaishnavas, you and the whole family, spiritual family, without the association of whom it would not be possible to do this either. I named Radha Govindas Babaji, our Param Gurudev, and there's a wonderful story that's told over and over again about him and his, his lilas in Vrindavan. One of the ways that he had of doing bhajan, most of you have heard this before, but it's beautiful and worth saying again. One of his ways of doing bhajan was to stand in the Yamuna River with the water up to his ears and chant. So he literally placed himself in the flow, not just in the metaphor, not in the figurative flow of spiritual energy, but the material flow of water carrying the energy of Radha across his body surrounded by divine water, divine water flowing and bringing love, as though his body was disappearing, becoming part of the flow itself, disappearing into the flow. A body in water is, is, is indistinct, cannot be distinguished from the water. The water touches us everywhere, all over the body. It touched, it touched Radha Govinda Swabaji all over the body. Everywhere where the body was, there was water. Everywhere the body was, there was divine flow, the energy of Radha. So the difference between Babaji's body and the divinity of the water 
disappeared. He became the flow. And this is such a beautiful meditation, a beautiful thing to remember also when we're paying our respects, because it's exactly the experience that we look for when we're trying to enter the flow of divine energy, trying to enter into Bhagavad Gita or any other spiritual practice. You could even say that Bhagavad Gita is the, is the Yamuna River. It's flowing. It's flowing and filled with the energy of Radha. And what we need to do is not just read the words. This is very interesting. But what we need to do is open our hearts and let Bhagavad Gita flow through us. Touch every part of our spiritual body. Let Bhagavad Gita come across us and explore every part of our spiritual shape. So this metaphor of the Yamuna as a flow of spiritual energy, washing away our material coverings and touching every part of our spiritual bodies. This is the perfect metaphor for reading Bhagavad Gita or any other, any other divine text. When we enter the flow, when we open ourselves to what's happening in the pages of the book, behind the words, and in the sound of the words, in the rhythm and the poetry of the words, in the music of the words, that's when we can find our way to the true message of a book like this. And that's how we can find our way to our ourselves, our divine selves as well, to our Atma. So Bhagavad Gita functions on two levels, maybe more, but two levels. One is to give us philosophy, to give us words and logical thoughts that can help us to understand the nature of the spiritual world, the nature of the universe. And this we need, this we want, we have to know, we have to understand. But on another level, there are many things going on behind, behind the words, in the music, in the poetry, in the feeling. And of course, I encourage you to learn a few tiny notions of Sanskrit, because if you hear how beautiful the Sanskrit is, how beautiful the poetry of especially Bhagavad Gita, but many other books, you, you begin to feel something very, very, very special. So what we talked about last time, um, Svarupa, and Svarupa Siddhi. Well, Prabhupada talks about it too. This process of purifying, this process of letting the Yamuda water wash away and let that water touch every part of our inside. That is what reading Bhagavad Gita and any spiritual books should, should be about. Trying to Understand the message, yes, of course, the philosophy, but trying to let it touch us too. And this requires a special mood, a special openness, a special generosity. And this openness is what we try to create in our, in our meditation and in our, in our lives. So now we talked about the introduction a lot, three hours, that's plenty. 
Uh, now we're in the, the text of Bhagavad Gita. And we hear the text. We hear it. We read it. We listen to how it sounds. If someone's reading Sanskrit and they can hear what it sounds like in the Sanskrit. But there are mysteries. There are things hidden in the text. There are feelings and emotions and experiences in the text. And this is the part we also need to connect to. You know, there's a mystery that we all we don't think about very often. And that's how words make us feel things. How words are meaningful. When we read anything, any any book, any text, there's something material on the page, there's ink on paper, or maybe computer ink on computer paper, doesn't matter. There's something entirely material there. And yet between that page and our eyes and our minds is created feeling, is created bhav. How does this happen? How can we read something on a page made of paper and ink? Something makes our fingers dirty. It comes to our minds and it touches our hearts as feeling. This is a question we always want to ask when we're studying, when we're studying Bhagavad Gita, but other texts as well. What is that miracle that changes ink to emotion? And that miracle is the divine. That miracle is the divine. Texts create meaning for us by that divine spark inside of us all. How does it make us feel? Why does it make us feel things? What do we imagine in our minds when we read Bhagavad Gita and other texts? How do we enjoy? What is that pleasure that meets our hearts when we read? How do words become feelings? This is among the great uh, mysteries of, of our practice, of our studying. I listen to you speak, and you bring tears to my eyes. You make my heart beat. You make me afraid. You make me wonder. All these spiritual things happen from a material experience. So there's something in this, this book. There's something behind the book. Under the, under the words on the page. Uh, something flowing there. And the more we can release ourselves and open ourselves to that thing behind the words, behind the philosophy, behind the um, doctrine, the more we can take from the philosophy, the more we can understand it, the more deeply we can understand it. So from this paper and cardboard and ink and, and dirt, we find the beauty of the divine and the feeling. So there's Radha Govinda Das Babaji standing in the Yamuna, chanting with the energy flowing over him perfectly, filling every pore, touching every part of him. And this is where we want to go when we're, when we're reading and listening and, and sharing uh, with Bhagavad Gita, finding the, the divine flow. Um,
It's good to remember, too, that Bhagavad Gita is a very strange book. We don't know who wrote it. So it has no beginning in that sense. It has no author in our, in our imaginations. Some people say it was written by many people, that it's put together in a, in a kind of collection. We don't know where it began, and we don't know where it would end, just like the divine flow of the universe. And another beautiful thing about Bhagavad Gita is that most commonly it's sung. Gita, of course, means song. It's the song of God. And in the way it was passed along traditionally, especially in the early centuries, was by singing, by being memorized and sung from one ear to the other. So the experience of singing is also an experience of connecting to something much deeper. When we sing, when we open our mouths, we open the air passageway from the deepest part inside us to the universe. And when we hear, we're bringing what is in the universe inside to our, our bodies and then into our minds. So Bhagavad Gita has no beginning. It has no end. It has no author. It has sound. It has only sound to be sung, to be read, allowed, um, to be to be repeated. And what is the difference between singing and speaking? Why do we sing in our practice? We can have a text with words and read it, or read it aloud even. And we can have a text with words that we sing. What's the difference between poetry and, and prose? Well, the text contains a message in the words, but the singing makes us bring the love of our hearts into expressing that message. It's impossible to sing and be cold and dry and empty. Anytime you sing, even if you're a terrible singer, there's love in your voice. There's an expression that's coming that not from words, non-verbal expression. There's something that's coming from your heart. It's impossible to sing and be unhappy. It's impossible to sing and be unspiritual. Singing is the proof of your eternal soul. And that's why we sing in our practice, to let that part come out. Yes, the words are important, but the expression is just as important. There are some thoughts to start with on Bhagavad Gita, um, on, on, on communication and on, on meaning. Before we add one last uh, thought about that, because, because we're going to talk about the mysteries of the text, what's behind the words, the chapter we'll start, chapter nine, is entitled Most Confidential Knowledge. I'll come back to it, I'll talk about it, but this word guya in Sanskrit means secret. It's the most secret knowledge. So we're gonna to want to ask, where is that secret knowledge hiding and how does it get to us? But I thought I would, since we're starting with chapter nine, and I could just say a few words about the chapters before, just so you have some, um, some direction. Please remember that Bhagavad Gita started to be sung 2,000 years before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came. 2,000 years before Gaudiya Vaishnavism, 2,000 years before Bhakti as a practice. So the one more mystery, if I want to add a mystery to the other mysteries I gave you today, one more mystery is um, how bhakti is already contained in Bhagavad Gita 2,000 years before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is a question for greater minds than mine. 
But the reason we read Prabhupada and the reason Gurudev is so interested in Prabhupada is because he shows us, shows us the trace, the roots, the beginning of Bhakti, Gaudiya Vaishnavism in this text, which is, comes far, far before um, Prabhu, uh, Mahaprabhu. Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters. You know this probably. And I said it before, uh, we often divide into three parts. One to six, seven to 12, 13 to 18. And one to six is about the relationship between the individual and the individual soul, the jiva, and God. It's the, it's the part that describes the relationship between the soul and God. It's a, it's a, it's a story that, that, uh, that uncovers for Arjuna the nature of his soul and the link between his soul and Krishna. And confirming to him that he can be, that he has relationship with Krishna. So it's what we often call Gopi Bhav, in the sense that the Gopis have at first, on the first level, an individual relationship with Krishna because they realize they have a soul. They're aware of their soul and therefore they're aware of their relationship to Krishna. There's an Atma, their soul or self, and there's a Paramatma, super soul or super self. And the Atma is linked to the Paramatma. And the Paramatma is a tiny bit of the Paramatma is in the Atma. So in these first six chapters, it starts in chapter one with this famous scene on the battlefield uh, of Karaksetra, where Arjuna begins this conversation with Krishna. There's lots to say about it, but we'll save that for another day. Chapter two describes the basic um, ideas about the soul, about the Atma, and what self-realization is. Chapter three talks about karma yoga or finding spiritual progress by doing pure actions through action that is pure, pure and selfless. Chapter four talks about Krishna's nature, what God is like, Krishna's divine nature. Chapter five talks about moksha, the liberation, how that's possible what the path is to reach it. Chapter six, you might remember, is, is like a handbook for meditation. It's telling us how to meditate. What are the rules and what are the, the good practices to meditate? And then chapter seven to 12, the second big block is about the relationship between Atma and Paramatma as one of devotion, devotional practice. Chapter seven starts with the basic way of realizing what devotion is. Chapter eight describes Krishna, God, as some um, energies that uh, are used in devotion. And these energies we understand correspond to Radha. And then we come to chapter nine. At last, you were probably saying. Chapter nine is special in many ways. And I'm going to try, try to point out two or three ways it's particularly special. Um, 
and I can share the screen if you like. I know that that helps Madhuya Rasa to do her work. The only problem is that I can't see all your beautiful faces then. There, I got you back. Okay. So chapter nine is called Most Confidential Knowledge. And when we first think about it, surely when I first started reading this and thought about it, I thought, oh, this is special knowledge. This is special knowledge that not people, not many people know about. Um, and that if I read this, then I'll learn about. It. So I just need to read and then it won't be confidential. It won't be secret. But it's more than that. Like I said, there's much behind the words. Because the word we're using here is guyatam, this word right here in Sanskrit. And it's here in the text down here. And then it comes up as it's translated as confidential. Here it's secret, sorry. You can see down in the, in the verse, it's translated as secret, but in the title, it's translated as confidential. It doesn't really matter the difference. The question we have is, what is it that's secret? What is the secret? For whom is it a secret? For who can reveal the secret? Who tells the secret? So every secret needs to have someone keeping the secret. And who is doing this? Is it Krishna? Is it Arjuna? Who is playing the game here with us? Who's playing the game of hide and seek with the secret? Well, it's neither Krishna nor Arjuna, but the divine reality itself. The secret we're talking about, the secret wisdom as it's called, is what's what reveals itself when we open our hearts to the, to the text and not just read it with our brains, with our minds. So the secret wisdom is the emotional experience behind the text. It's the devotional experience we have when we read Bhagavad Gita. When we understand Bhagavad Gita as philosophy, it's one thing, when we understand it as bhakti, as devotion, then it's another thing. So the secret is right there before us. We have this expression in um, English, it's hidden in broad daylight. It's right there in front of us, but we cannot see it. I see Gurudev. Does Gurudev want to intervene, say something, comment? No? Okay. Rade, rade. <laughs> So the text, the uh, verse says, the supreme... Okay. Radha, Radha, Dhanavat. I'm so excited to listen to your words. You are opening the secret. Gopi guy is also sitting all over here listening. Oh, so I'm nice. proud of your words. <laughs> Guru Kripa. Guru Kripa. Jai Radha. Jai 
So the verse says, the Supreme Lord said, because you are never envious of me, I shall impart to you, I shall give you this most secret wisdom, knowing which, when you know it, you shall be relieved of the miseries of material existence. The secret wisdom is the divine love within the text, the beauty in the text, the thing it inspires in us when we read. And as soon as we open our hearts to this and read it by following Krishna's advice in this, in this verse, as soon as we open our hearts to the beauty, to the love, to the devotional aspect of the text, we will then be freed. It's not enough to read and understand with our intelligence. We must open ourselves and feel the devotional reality behind the words, behind any words, actually. So the purport from Prabhupada then is, as a devotee hears more and more about the Supreme Lord, he becomes enlightened. Now, is it because, now, is it because the devotee is a big bucket? His head is a bucket and we fill it with the knowledge from reading more and more? No. It's because he feels more and more. The devotee feels more and more when he, when he or she hears more and more. There's an increase in pleasure, an increase in love. And this is the path to enlightenment. He becomes more enlightenment. Then Prabhupada goes on, this hearing process is recommended in Srimad Bhagavatam. And then he quotes, the messages the messages of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, of the Lord, are full of potencies. And these potencies can be realized if topics regarding Supreme Godhead are discussed among devotees. The messages are full of potencies. The messages are full of energy. What is this energy inside the message? Radha. This is Radha. What gives the message, the philosophical dry message, a meaning is the loving energy inside it. Not like an egg inside it, not like inside an egg or some, some kind of shell, but rather the energy that makes it enter into us. The reason we absorb it, the reason we have we find meaning in the words, the reason they touch us and make us smile or cry, they make our body warm, they make us afraid. This energy, this is Radha, the pleasure-giving potency of Krishna. So the path to feeling the divine text is uh, the adherence to to Radha. It's a kind of the kind of Manjuri Bhav already wanting to feel the text and not just listen to it with our with our minds. So the Bhagavad Srimad Bhagavatam continues. This cannot be achieved by the association of mental speculators or academic scholars, for it is realized knowledge. I'm going to talk about realized knowledge in a minute. But the point here is, we cannot have this experience when we're just talking amongst 
speculators, when we're talking about amongst philosophers, philosophers, when we're just listening to the meaning of the words. So when I'm with a, with a classroom of students who have no feeling for the material, no feeling for me, then nothing of this can pass. But when I'm talking with you, my brothers and sisters, when I'm talking with Gurudev, and there's an opening of love, which is already there, I already love you, and you already love me. It's like an opening of a door that lets the, the, the message of the text uh, come through. This feeling of association, this opening of the door has many forms. Let's continue. The devotees, says Prabhupada, are constantly engaged in the Supreme Lord's service. The Lord understands the mentality and sincerity of a particular living entity who is engaged in Krishna consciousness and gives him or her the intelligence to understand the science in the association of devotees. So the Lord knows how your heart is open, your sincerity, your mental state, your mentality. And the, as much as your heart is open to the message, that much you will be given back by Krishna, by the Lord. To the degree that you open your heart, the degree you surrender to what's the mystery in the text, to that degree you will get back, exactly to that degree. Discussion, Prabhupada continues, discussion of Krishna is very potent. What we remember about potency, this is Radha. Discussion of Krishna is very full of Radha, very full of divine love. And if a fortunate person, like all you are, in the association, um, sorry, I lost my bits. A fortunate person has such association and tries to assimilate the knowledge, like all you are doing, just by being together with me then he or she will surely make advancement towards spiritual realization. It's through the association, the sharing of feelings, and opening the hearts that this advancement will happen. Lord Krishna, in order to encourage Arjuna, Prabhupada says, to higher and higher elevation in his potent service, in his service of Radha, describes in this ninth chapter matters more confidential than any he has already disclosed. So already in the first eight chapters of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna has opened his heart, just like you are opening your hearts. And the more Arjuna opens his heart, the more Krishna can pour into his heart of that divine message. The very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada says, the first chapter is more or less an introduction to the rest of the book. And in the second chapters, second and third chapters, the spiritual knowledge is described, sorry, the spiritual knowledge described is called confidential. So already, in chapter 2, when Krishna reveals the reality of the soul to Arjuna, that he has a soul and he must not forget his soul, he's already making it possible for him to know about the, the, the mystery behind the words. He's already making the, the, the potency, the energy of Radha available to him. He's giving him a little hint, giving him a little smell of the taste 
of what Durada's pleasures will be there, that confidential knowledge, that spiritual knowledge, already then. And then it grows and grows and grows to the point where in these next chapters it will become very great. I continue. Topics discussed in the seventh and eighth chapters are specifically related to to devotional service. That's the chapters just before here, where the idea of bhakti, of devotion, is introduced. They are called more confidential. There's, that is, there's more rasa in the words. And it's not because the words cha- have changed, it's because you have changed, my brothers and sisters. But the matters which are described in ninth chapter deal with unalloyed, that means pure, unalloyed, pure devotion. So the mystery is greatest here. And therefore, this is called the most confidential, the most secretive, because it lies deepest in the words. And because you are now, you all Arjunas, are now able to access the depth of feeling behind these words. One who is situated in the most confidential knowledge of Krishna is naturally transcendental. Naturally transcendental. Whenever you hear the word natural in Bhagavad Gita, you must remember what Gurudev has taught us about the last, and we read it ourselves the first day, the last chapter of, the last verse of Bhagavad Gita, which talks about spiritual, the, the, the full svarupa, the spir- full spiritual identity as being the natural resting place. We are natural spiritual beings. It's not something we have to pretend to be. It's not something artificial. When we are in our svarup, we are most ourselves, and that's where we started from, and that's where we're going back to. So anytime you read the word natural in Bhagavad Gita, you know this is what we're thinking about that it's our svarupa, it's our constitution, it's our basis, it's our foundation. So we are naturally transcendental. We are naturally opening to the spiritual substance, to the rasa that's in every verse. That's the most confidential. Prabhupada continues, one who is situated in the most confidential knowledge of Krishna, is naturally transcendental. He therefore has no more material pangs, no more material itching or desires, even though he's in the material world. So once we find our place, our situation, maybe we could even translate situation by saying our staibhav, because we talk about staibhav so much here, we find our basis, our situation, then this transcendental insight is just natural. It's easy. There's no trying. There's no effort. It's where we belong. It's where we are most ourselves. We just lie back and and relax and, and enjoy it. In the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, so Rupa Goswami's important book, it is said that although one who has a sincere desire to render loving service to the Supreme Lord is situated in the conditional state of material existence, he is to be considered liberated. So we don't have to leave our body to have this liberation. Indeed, in order to do devotional service, we need to have a body. We need to be able to do things with our body. There are two ways of being in our body, spiritually or materially. I can be washing the temple floor 
because somebody told me to do it and I'm just there washing the temple floor. Or I could be washing the temple floor because I'm doing it in de as, as devotional service. I'm doing it for Radha Mohan. And the, our position, our spiritual position, our transcendental position is completely different for the two. We're in two different places, depending only depending on the love with which we do, the loving devotion with which we do the washing of the floor. So two people, side by side, on their hands and knees, in the temple, each one with a bucket of water, each one with a washing brush, washing away, and one is in transcendental state, and the other is in material state. We don't need to leave the body to have this transcendental um, experience. Prabhupada goes on. Now this first verse has spe specific significance. Knowledge, idam gyanam, refers to pure devotional service, which consists of nine different activities. Hearing, chanting, remembering, serving, worshipping, praying, obeying, maintaining friendship, and surrendering everything. By the practice of these nine elements of devotional service, one is elevated to spiritual consciousness, Krishna consciousness. At the time when one's heart is cleared of the material contamination, at that time, one at the time when one's heart is cleared of the material consciousness, sorry, I, I start again. By the practice of these nine elements of devotional service, one is elevated to spiritual consciousness, Krishna consciousness. And the time when one's heart is cleared of the material contamination, one can understand the science of Krishna. When the covering is taken away, we can find our path into the mystery of the text. Simply to understand, Prabhupada says, simply to understand that a living entity is not material, is not sufficient. That's a philosopher's point of view. Hmm? It's good, yes, there's something else than material body. There's some psychology, there's some thoughts going on there, but this is not enough. It's not enough to know we have a consciousness. I go on. That may be the beginning of spiritual realization. But one should recognize the difference between activities of the body and the spiritual activities by which one understands that he is not the body. So again, remember the two people washing the floor of the temple. Two buckets of water, two brushes, two people. One is doing it in the service of Radha and the other one is not. The one is transcending, and the other one is not. On this question of knowledge, I want to show you something here. I go back up to the verse. And you hear, have here in the Sanskrit verse, Jnanam Vigyana Sahitam which means knowledge with, sorry, knowledge with uh, uh, realized knowledge. So this little bit V, Vigyana, it does two things, two special things. It makes Jnanam more intense. 
So it's knowledge, but deeper knowledge, more intense knowledge, more bigger knowledge. But V also gives a kind of practical side to it. So jnanam with practical knowledge. Sorry, knowledge with practical knowledge. That's what we're seeking. And this taught me something in my meditations about what realization is. I don't know if you have the same experience as me, but we talk always in sharing about realizations. Did you realize something? Do you have a realization? I had a realization. That's a nice realization. <laughs> and I've, I'm often not sure what that means. But this helps me to understand it. Jnanam is knowledge, or maybe you could say philosopher's knowledge or theoretical knowledge. It's knowledge that's useful and, and important and true. Vijnana means knowledge that we found in our experience. Knowledge that comes through us to us through some kind of inner experience, through some kind of practical experience in our lives. This practical knowledge is something we've lived. We felt it in our hearts. Theoretical knowledge is outside. It's in my book. Huh? It's in my library. It's in the television or the computer. It's outside me. I don't have a relationship to it, except intellectually. Vijnana, realized knowledge, is knowledge that I've lived. It's knowledge that is inside me, and it's revealed to me as inside me. So when I thought about this word realized, I realized, sorry, just not joking, realized knowledge means knowledge that has become reality for me. Realized is reality. A realization is not something transcendental, like suddenly I saw at Adam Mohan in person and uh, found something new and incredible. No. Realization, our realization, is discovering the reality of knowledge in my own soul of realizing, sorry to use the word again, of seeing in myself that knowledge. Knowledge that I don't go to my book or my computer or to the newspaper to find. A realization is the reality of the knowledge in my own soul. This is what a realization is. So when we're sitting in our sharing together, all of us together, we're not trying to go out of our bodies to find realization. We're trying to go into our souls to find the reality of knowledge within our own souls, within our own Atma, to find the link between our Atma as individuals and the Paramatma, the super soul, to find that little bit of God in us and when we realize, we found the reality of that. We found out that it's actually real there. And we felt it or seen it. So realization is an experience of the self, an experience of God, of Radha Mohan, in our own selves. This is the meaning of Gyanam Vigyana Sahitam. Knowledge with realized knowledge. Theoretical knowledge, the philosopher's knowledge that we talk about, made real within ourselves. This is what we seek. And this is what Krishna promises to Arjuna. That's the secret behind the words. Hmm. I think that was a lot to say for one day, and I think I'm going to stop talking now. And uh, if somebody would like to share, or a Gurudev comment, then that's a good time for that.
may I ask about this topic? I mean, um, I think there's an expression for this also in companies. This is like I implicit knowledge, implicit as reason. So how is that properly um, presented or transferred or, or yeah, like in this parampara? If you have it in a company, you usually have this problem that some elder people, like senior people know something and nobody really writes it down and yeah, you probably never get to find it out in all details. So how would be the knowledge transfer tradition like for us in this tradition properly done? This very, very good question. Thank you. We implicit knowledge is very good way to say it. It's knowledge which comes from um, Radha Mohan living in us. It's knowledge that comes from the little bit of God in us, the Atma in the the, the little bit of uh, Paramatma in the Atma. And this means that the knowledge is already there. The knowledge is already in our spiritual selves, the important knowledge, the essential knowledge. So it's implicit, to use your word. Your word is a very good one. It's implicit in us, but we cannot see it. We cannot see it, most of us. It's covered, and it's covered by our material um, our material existence by, by material um, reality. So the path to realization is not by those intellectual words of the older and smarter men, but it's by the feelings that they evoke, the feelings that they transmit to us through the parampara, which help us to go inside ourselves and find the door to that knowledge we already have, that experience we already have. Again, our path, according to Prabhupada and Guru Dev, is to return to our constitutional position, return to our svaru. This is our resting point. This is our starting point and our resting point. And the path to that can be helped by intellectual knowledge that you can write down in a book that the smart elders can give in their books. But the essential path is to open the door within ourselves and find its reality in ourselves. So this, this image that you describe, which is a really common one, of the smart men sitting around talking, and saying things that we not smart men and women don't know. This has limited help for us. It has some help for, for our spiritual path, but it's limited. It's limited by our own covering. And what we really need is, is, is leaders, gurus, teachers, who can help us to find our souls not just to read the books. So the, the most blessed guru like ours is one who does both things, who teaches us things and with the words opens our hearts. <coughs> Did this make sense to you, Divya Prem? Yes, so reveal or, or <coughs> activate um, the thing already in there. But oh, I see does that really help practically? I mean, to, to just know these things are there, also theoretically, will probably not help in a real life situation. <laughs> yes, it will help. No, I mean, watching, associating with devotees, seeing the way that sadhus live, experiencing their emotions, their love, watching, uh, 
these are the things that help us on the path. We can read the books ourselves, and we should. But so when you talk about personal wisdom, yes, wisdom that's not that's not based on um, uh, wisdom that's not based on the intellect, experience that's not based on the intellect, insight that's not based on the intellect. The transfer then happens by by the energy, not by the content. It's by being together with beautiful devotees, brothers and sisters like we have today. It's by sitting with Gurudev or doing Zooms with Gurudev. And by this transfer of energy that this transfer happens. It doesn't happen by lectures. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I'm sorry to say because I'm a professional lecturer, actually. So it's a difficult situation. <laughs> but the important thing happens by the transfer of feeling, by the proximity. This is why we have this beautiful word association. We stay together with, with devotees. No? Well, I'm going to take away my screen now. I can't say it. Radhe, Radhe. Please, Radhe, Radhe. Help, help, help me, Gurudev. Yeah, I'm very proud of your lecture today. Mm -hmm. Really, you give the essence that I think that, my God, you are so close with Prabhupada. You catch the heart of Prabhupada, and you are telling the things what you want to say. You got the key, my dear, of <laughs> relaxation. My love and blessings to you. Mm. You are, you no need. Everything is, you are connected. Mm. You know the point to, and the, uh, where to go and what is the goal of life. Thank you. Mm. I'm very proud. And mm. all our listening Gopi guys sitting here, and mm. Pranavallava from Switzerland. Oh, nice. And Bhagavat Amrita was also there. Mm -hmm. Just he went from uh, Gopika oh, also okay. or something. <laughs> yeah. Radhe, Radhe. Radhe, Radhe, Gopika. Well, thank you, Madhavanga, yeah, for this beautiful sharing. Just. Um, I can't pick it. Just it. How they will know that you are good. They see good. They can see me here, yeah, but now can. you will. I know the voice too. <laughs> Just I was um, yesterday. We also had one nice sharing. Um, we were we were sharing about the relationship between humility and love. Wow. And the point was this: that the the great. I mean, when you reach the topmost point of humility, which one could maybe say is the bottom most point because humility is about then then you're also experiencing fully unconditional love. Mm. And I was just feeling this in relation to your beautiful sharing about realization and why we don't realize or why we realize mm. that this is like a gradual flow on the and the process by which the more we go deeper in soul consciousness, the more automatically we become more humble because humble, yeah. that's the process, right? The yeah. soul, when you're in soul consciousness, is a very humble state. Mm -hmm. And mm. and it's like the pouring, when you pour from a jug into a glass, the jug always ha the jug has to always be higher. So the more humble we become, the more you know that large waterfall can just fill mm. us up. Yeah. And and then I saw in the beginning the verse is saying that Arjuna, because you are not envious with me, so I can share with you mm. the deepest you know secrets. I'm not sure about you. So and I just nice. felt this, this whole process is connected, you know, like the, 
the deeper we go on the path, the more we understand that everything is coming by mercy. Mm. And the more intimate our relationship becomes to Radharani, the more humble we become and the more we can realize. Yeah. So I, it's just the same. Uh, so nice I do. A wonderful sharing, you know, that was this inspiration just comes. <laughs> oh, no. this, we didn't talk about envy. We need to, maybe next time, we'll, we'll take that up next week. Beautiful, yeah, exactly. And humility. I took notes. Well, because envy is again, uh, envy is again in our, when we are in our false ego, then envy is there. And of course, our big ego is always the biggest blockage for for receiving spiritual realization. Yeah. Yeah. We are looking in the outside and not in this beautiful space that you were just speaking about in our own soul. So. Lovely. That was not a very good question. Yeah, no, was it was a, you don't need to ask a question. You have the, you have the insights. Sharing. <laughs> yes. I'm inspired. I'm putting in my notes. From your beautiful sharing, I'm so grateful that you are that you are sharing about Bhagavad Gita. It's it's really giving so much realization to all of us. To, to oh, so nice. Thank you. So oh, nice, Radhe, Radhe. Turn the camera to you, you know? No, no. <laughs> Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam there is Gita another one. There is also another tablet. Noise. You just spoke. Yeah. Radhe, Radhe, Uda, Prabhu. Radhe, Radhe, I am happy to know that you are coming very soon. Yes. Next uh, nice. next lesson will be from Munger Mandir. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, we feel very inspired by the explanations and realizations. And it's... Uh, I just was... When Radhika was talking, I just was thinking about the only three words of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Cheto, Darpana, Marjanam. The, the process of cleaning our real identity, that is very shiny and very, it's like a mirror that we can see, but we are very, due to the not cleaning, we it's very dusty and we don't see the proper the properties mm -hmm. and the qualities and the realizations of our real personality. Then mm -hmm. by be, being covered, we are we lost many things. We are just acting with the ego and we are so uh, thinking everything outside in a very material way. But if we really do this cleaning, this cleaning of the harcheto, darpana, martana, then we will come to our natural identity, our real identity, our eternal identity. Mm -hmm. And all these things, like like just now, uh, that uh, Topika, she was saying about the, she was talking about the humility. These are things that are normal that come when the heart is clean. When, when we just take out all the dust, the, or the nature of the humility, service, dedication, uh, devotion, uh, all this come is, is, the, is opening this hidden truth, this hidden um, knowledge, this hidden uh, realization that is that Prabhupada like to inject in all the in all the all the way in Bhagavad Gita, he was just coming to give us like a hope that we can transform from the very external consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, very material consciousness, we can recover our real, real eternal identity. Mm -hmm. Then this is the the this is just the meditation that uh, I was following in, in the words and also the way that how Sumati Radharani is in a hidden way, but is the object that mm -hmm. have to be studied and understand uh, in, in, in Bhagavad Gita. 
Mm. Yeah, and one of the thing is this, in Bhagavad Gita, you find it about the Radhika. Mm-hmm. How hidden tree Radharani is there and how hidden is my constitutional position, normality is required. That is a very special thing. Hmm. It's not easy to s- locate and fix in that heart. Hmm. And this is the goal. And this is the confidential message, what you are telling. Hmm. This is confidential. To know what is behind in this lines and book? Mm. And thank you. I feel it and I realize it with your words that you prove with that. Very good. Energy of Krishna is only Radha. Mm. And Krishna cannot understand himself mm-hmm. without his energy. Mm-hmm. He's 15, 10, 15. You, you read one day to me. Yeah. So you fix in that energy. You see that energy. And this is the great mercy of Radhika to you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. This is the key. This is the key. When we understand, we connected in our constitutional position, all become crystal clear. Hmm. Rathe. Rathe, Rathe. is also from Switzerland. Well. He, also, he is also a very old devotee of Prabhupada hmm. and very. So nice, Radhibaya. He's from Switzerland. Yes, I'm very inspired from all of you. We were discussing also this morning about that. That the process is very important, especially how we can clean all the dogs from the heart so that we can come to the essence to the soul consciousness because we are at so much contamination in our heart from all our millions of lives being in this material world and doing all kinds of things so I think this bhakti process is the most high process, most elevated process. And by the chanting of this Hare Krishna Mahamantra, that is the real thing, how we can cleaning up our heart and come to the essence. It's like cleaning the mirror so that we can see the clearer the mirror is, that the more clear we can see the picture. That means the more we can see the soul, what we are, and that is our constitutional position, is that we are the spirit soul, and we are not this material body. But then we were discussing this morning, when we say we are not this material body, then what body are we then? Because the soul is not without form, So we have an eternal spiritual body, like we have a, how to say, this material body who is not eternal. What is the word? So, it's a constitutional position. That is our real body is our eternal spiritual body. So form has to be there, and only with form we can have a relationship with Adam and Pan. So only with our monthly form and our spiritual body, 
we can say that we can have a relationship like with this body. We have also form and we have relationships also with other people. We just made this very nice example of two lamps. The lamps, they are there for many years, but because they have no form, they cannot have a relationship. Mm -hmm. So relationship is something very important. So we can learn how to exchange, how to love, how to care for each other. These are things that we have to learn and to do mm -hmm. quality, to develop the good qualities. Because as you said, this knowledge, this Satchitananda, is already within us, all these qualities, but they are covered. The devotional process, Sadhu Sangha, association with devotees, like-minded devotees, and we are in the process, in the practical process of chanting, in devotional service, chanting together, with sadhus, then we can come to the essence, because we are cleaning out all the dust, all the hindrances that we have, our ego, the mind, and all the bad qualities. Mm. So this association with all of you and these nice lectures and speeches is always inspiring to me to stay in the process and go on with it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop here. At, uh, I want to tell you a little secret, though. That I got. Um, I first read the uh, Bhagavad Gita in two thousand and five, when somebody gave it to me as a gift, and that somebody was Gopika. Radhe Radhe.